All right, everybody, how are you doing today? Uh, so, I often run out of time in this talk, so I'm going to try to uh, get us started as quickly as possible. Uh, and then also apologize because some of the concepts I'm going to breeze through pretty quick. Uh, but certainly I'll be available after the talk if you guys want to ask any questions or later as well. Uh, on this intro slide here, uh, notice that there's a GitHub URL. Um, so the source code for the demo app that I'm talking about uh, in this presentation is available there. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at code in this talk. It's going to be a little more conceptual and kind of demo based. Uh, but feel free to grab it now if you want to, to play with it or later. Uh, so it has all the code for the demo that I'll show you today. And the other thing is, I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm always gesturing at things, especially when we get to some of these diagrams. I'm going to be pointing at them, and I probably need like a laser pointer or something, but I uh, don't have one, so you'll just have to assume what I'm pointing at. All right, ready to go? So uh, first of all, this overview of what we're going to talk about today, uh, I'll give you some motivation for why I looked into neural networks for a particular problem I was interested in solving. Uh, then we're going to spend the big bulk of the talk really just talking about what neural networks are and kind of how they're structured and um, how to implement one a little bit, just a high level of implementing it. We're going to rely on a library that sort of implements the core uh, work of a neural network and we'll just kind of build our structure on top of that and I'll show you what I did. For this prototype, it's an iPad app that is uh, capable of recognizing shapes that you draw. So in this case, just simple shapes, circle, triangle, square is where I started. Uh, and that's what the source code that's available uh, is for that iPad app. So I'll talk about what went into building that iPad app and some of the uh, little tricks and some of the art to building the neural network and the way that it worked for this particular application. And then finally, because it's a prototype, for something that I'm interested in deploying in a larger application at some point, there's definitely lots of things that I don't take care of, right? It's just the, the final polish, that last 10% to really make it really usable, uh, requires some more thought and analysis that I'm not going to get into in the talk today, except to say here's the things that you need to think about if you were going to do something similar to this. <clears throat> so first, the motivation, why I ended up looking into uh, neural networks. Uh, so I make an application for the Mac with some pals of mine called Napkin, and it heavily relies on gestures to drive the uh, user interface. So when we were looking at Napkin and the future of it and features we might want to add, and also just thinking about, like, what if we ever did an iOS port? By the way, the features in iOS 11 probably mean there'll never be an iOS port of Napkin, but nonetheless, it was a good thought experiment. Uh, we realized that the current way that we supported gestures was kind of fragile, and it was difficult to add new things. Uh, and we wanted to look at something that was flexible and could kind of grow with us as we went to do something more complicated that we have. So let me just quickly show you what, how Napkin uses gestures and kind of what we were looking at and why I went down this path. <clears throat> so Napkin's a real simple app that's designed just for annotating one or more images. You can slap some annotations on it real quick and then kick that new thing, new image out to other people. We don't really have tools in Napkin, like an arrow tool or a shape tool or a text tool. We just sort of interpret squiggles and gestures that you make on the canvas as to what you intended to create, right? So for instance, if I go and drag out something that looks like a line, I get an arrow, right? That kind of makes a new canvas item. That's an arrow that could be moved around. If I draw something that's kind of similar to a square or a rectangle, uh, I get a shape that's of that same sort of uh, characteristic, right? And then also if I draw something that's kind of round, whoops, I totally did that wrong, excuse me. If I draw something that's kind of round, uh, we get something we call a call out. This is just a uh, way to magnify part of an image to call detail to it, right? So we have this thing where we recognize kind of three different gestures. Um, but it's kind of fragile. It's a little bit dependent on the speed that you draw the strokes at. So it might be a little different when you're using a mouse versus a trackpad, for instance. Uh, and it's completely rules-based, right? So we're just looking at like, Here's the path that the user seems to have drawn. Does it have corners? How many corners does it have? Does it change direction and things like that uh, to decide? So if you wanted to make this more complex, what if we wanted to detect you know, octagons and starbursts and maybe something that looks like columns of text or something? Those rules are going to get super complex really quick and they're going to start to conflict with each other. and It's going to be really hard to debug and uh, work with. So when I went looking into the research for solutions to this, uh, neural networks popped up as the most likely answer, so that's why I took a little bit of a dive to figure out how to use them. Let's pop back to Keynote real quick. So let's get into the specifics of what an uh, artificial neural network is, right? Uh, and so really it's just a system that we don't give it a set of rules, 
we have it accomplish its task by learning from example, right? Um, so it's kind of like a black box. So I just made this goofy diagram that's got a bunch of knobs on it, you know, the black box with a bunch of knobs. And these knobs are the different parameters that we can adjust in the neural network. And if we've done it right, we hand it some sort of input. So images are the quintessential example for a neural network. Um, handed an image of a dog, and then out from the network would become a classification that says, hey, that thing was a dog, right? And the way that this works is we don't turn the knobs and put them in specific places with intent. We sort of set the knobs to a bunch of random places, and then we just keep providing a lot of different examples to the network of the things we want to classify. So let's say we're trying to detect animals. And so here's a dog. And we tell the network, it's a dog. You were wrong. You said it was a cat. And so then the network makes slight adjustments to those knobs. And then we give it another dog, and it happens again. And then we give it a cat, and then maybe it happens again. Until eventually, if you do that enough, and you've set up the structure of the network properly to be able to classify the sort of things that you're interested in classifying, uh, we'll have a network that can the black box will then be able to just take any kind of picture of an animal and give us, the, even one it's never seen before, and give us the right answer for classifying it. So this is uh, categorized as a machine learning technique. Uh, neural networks are a very simple model that's inspired by biological nervous systems uh, and brains, but I just want to make it clear it's not like simulating a brain, right? Like it's not that sophisticated, it's just more inspired by hey, we can look at these uh, simple nervous systems and animals that can do these complex tasks that are way more, less complicated than the computers that we have, but we, with all the computational power we have, using our traditional techniques, solving these problems was difficult, so it's kind of approaching it from a different manner. Very low level technique, right, like that kind of black box. Uh, it's not like a, a, a high level rule system or an expert system. It's another type of artificial intelligence that's been around for years. It's closer to what we did in mapping. And there's two key features to any neural network. Uh, they're great at pattern recognition, which is exactly what we want, right? We want to be able to recognize certain types of shapes for this uh, gestures that we're doing. And then they're capable of learning. And I thought that that was a really cool thing, too. Uh, so that's one thing. It's how you achieve the network uh, in this system, how it gets, you get it to get the proper answers. But also, the fact that it can learn means that it could adjust, right? And so if you think about the disappointment that happens with a lot of natural type interfaces is when they don't work. Like Siri's disappointing. It works 90% of the time, and then the 10% that it doesn't is what everyone talks about, right? Um, and so when I was thinking about providing these type of interface to our application, I wanted to make sure that we had some mechanism for a user to help make it better, to help to correct it, uh, right? And so this fact that you can do learning and you don't have to reprogram the system to do learning seemed like an advantageous feature to explore for the application I was looking at. So let me talk now a little bit about the key components of an artificial neural network. <coughs> um, so the model is basically, there's just two pieces. We have the neuron, and the neuron's really just like a node in a graph that's gonna sum up all the signals that are coming into it and give out an output signal, okay? Uh, and I put signals in quotes there because this is a word that, I have a DSP background, and so people say signals all the time, and maybe it's not clear what it means. But signals really often just sort of a representation a numerical representation of some real-world data, an image, an uh, audio waveform, you know, a piece of video or something like that, or some other data. So it really comes down to a signal in this sense is just a sequence of floating point numbers, right, like uh, that we provide to our software. Uh, the activation function is the second part of the neuron, so it sums up, so some many number potentially of signals come into the neuron, it adds them all together, and then it puts it through this activation function that just kind of decides what the output of the neuron is going to be. And the best way to visualize this is probably the simple thresholding activation function, which just sort of says, if all the signals that came into me were over a certain amount, then I'm going to say I'm on. Otherwise, I'm going to say I'm off. Now that simplistic thresholding function is a little complicated in the analysis of the math, so that's not what we really use at a neural network, and I'll get into the details of that later but it kind of helps you conceptualize what's going on, right? <clears throat> how these things are put together. Uh, so the synapses are the other piece, and then this is what connects the neurons together. So these are just like the lines connecting the graph, right? And they really just have one function. It's sort of, so well, I guess two functions. It says this neuron's output is hooked to the input of this other neuron, and I'm going to scale it or attenuate. I'm gonna make it bigger, like amplify it, or make it smaller based on some weighting, right? We call that a weight. Uh, so that's all there really is to the main structure of the neural network. Here's a diagram, hopefully makes it a little more concrete. 
So here we have an example where there's five different si signals coming into this one neuron. That sigma there just kind of represents the uh, summation, right, uh, in math. So all those are summed up. The w's are just a different weight. So those are just going to be floating point values, you know, usually between like negative one and one or zero and one. That are going to scale those signals coming into any one particular neuron. On the other half of the uh, neuron in the diagram is that funny little s, and that's the activation function. And we'll talk about why it's that shape in just a little bit. Uh, but that's just sort of like that thresholding thing. Like it controls based on what came in, what does the uh, neuron put out? And then you can see that the signal then travels on and might go to many other different neurons, right? Or could just be the output of the network as well. So to go a little deeper on the activation functions, uh, a neuron's activation function just sort of uh, you know, controls the output that comes based on the input. A real simple one is linear. So that would just be like we take whatever came in and either scale it up or down. But we can't model very sophisticated real world systems using that type of uh, activation function. And the threshold gets to something that's more interesting and closer to how real biological systems work. But like I said, it's much harder to analyze the threshold function uh, mathematically to get to the learning part, for us to achieve the learning part of the neural network. So what you'll typically find is something called a sigmoid function that kind of squashes the inputs between 0 and 1 or negative 1 and 1. It's that S shape. That If we grow, do a graph of the sigmoid function, it would be that S shape that we saw back in the other diagram. Or also uh, hyperbolic tangents and other things, but they're all basically kind of doing the same thing. So we'll stick with sigmoid because it's easier to analyze and you'll find it in most of the literature and the examples out there. And just for reference, this is kind of what that function looks like if we graph it. That, that's the actual function there, y equals 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x. Uh, and you can see, as we have really negative inputs, the output of the sigmoid function is very close to 0. But as we start creeping closer to 0, the sigmoid function starts to rise up. And then as we have positive values, it also puts out a higher value. And then um, if we get a really big value, it's still going to keep it all bounded at 1, right? And so that property is pretty good, too, because you know, we don't want these unbounded huge numbers, right? We kind of want to keep things under control. And so this squashing helps with that as well. So when we have all those neurons and synapses, we make the network part of it by kind of stringing it together in something like this. Now, this is really simple, right? Like a real functional neural network is going to have a lot more inputs and hidden layers and output nodes, potentially. But just to make it simple, uh, we can see that the, we start on the left. And usually these things are kind of considered left to right, like the signals kind of flow in that direction. And we have some number of input nodes, and that represents the data that's coming in. Remember, this is just going to be floating point numbers. And then all of those <coughs> um, arrows that are connecting it are like the synapses. And each one of those will have a different weight that it'll scale that floating point number by that then gets summed up in the next neuron, right? And notice that this is what we would call fully connected. Like every node on one side is connected to all of the nodes on the next side, right? Uh, and so that's what kind of increases the learning capacity of the network. Uh, you could get away with not necessarily doing that, but you would decrease the ability for the network to be able to uh, achieve its maximum learning in that way. Now notice that the layer in the middle is called the hidden layer, just kind of tradition that the things we care about, the input and the output are sort of the two ends of the black box, and everything in the middle is called the hidden layer. You can have more than one hidden layer. When we hear talk, people talking about like uh, deep learning uh, and uh, some of the really sophisticated like image recognition systems that are out there, they do have many layers uh, in there, right? Um, but if we can achieve what we're doing today with just one hidden layer. You can do quite a bit with just one. So I want to point out that this is a feed-forward neural, ne neural network. So the signals only travel in one direction. So that's why all those arrows were kind of pointing from left to right. Uh, there's no feedback. So that means that no output from one node ever ends up also contributing to the input to that same node. Certainly, real world systems do that. And you can model crazy complex things doing that. But that's also really hard to analyze. And you can imagine, we've all heard feedback from a microphone. It can get out of control really quick. Uh, so we can do a lot of really cool things without having to have the feedback. And so that's how we structure these. To make it a little more concrete again, here's just an example of like a simple neural network that actually has some values attached to it so we can sort of see the kind of math that's going on in this process, right? So we have some inputs that are floating point numbers, and if we look at that top input, it's 0.5, then it feeds into the first hidden layer node, 
and the weighting on that synapse is 0.25. So that means the value of 0.125 ends up as the input on that synapse to that first hidden layer. This is where I wish I had my laser pointer. In the uh, second input, its value is 1. The weighting is that 0.5 that's on the arrow between it and that first hidden layer. So that means that one gets scaled down to 0.5. Those, that's added to the previous 0.125, so the value that's summed and arrives at that hidden layer node is 0.625, right? Uh, then that also then outputs to the next layer. I skipped the activation function here, right? So what would really happen is that 0.6625 would be subject to whatever happens in that sigmoid function. But just to make this simpler, we say, oh, okay, that one is also scaled by 0.1, uh, and then you can see at the bottom, if we went through the same process with that node, we'd get 0.3 that ends up coming in, and those two are summed up, and so the output at that node would be 0.3625, right? Um, now, one thing to think about is those weights kind of intuitively mean how much does this synapse, or excuse me, this neuron mean to the next neuron, right? So the output, this particular output node, only needs a little bit of contribution from the first hidden layer, but depends quite heavily on the contribution from the second hidden layer. And each of the neurons is kind of responsible for abstractly classifying some part of the data, right? So like if we wanted to think about it, you know, it doesn't really work out quite this simply, but if we think about those deep learning uh, things that can recognize animals or something, maybe one neuron sort of like, I'm the eyeball neuron. It's not quite that simple, but something like that. And one might be the fur neuron, right? And so each of those might contribute differently to deciding what type of animal it is. And that's why a certain output would take different amounts of those. I have a little demo that will help maybe visualize that in a, in a bit as well. Okay, so the outputs are the last important part of it. Um, so we basically need one output for each type of thing that we're going to classify. So in my demo today, we're trying to classify circles, squares, and triangles. So we're going to need three output nodes. And basically, if any one of those output nodes gets a large value, we're going to say, hey, that was probably the type of input that we provided to the system. Right? And so those outputs in, in my demo are going to be between 0 and 1. Other systems might have different values that they classify with, but that works fine. You can kind of almost treat that like a confidence value. Right? It's, not, it's not really statistically like between 0 and 100%, but you could say, oh, if it's 0.9 or higher, we're fairly confident that this really is a square. <clears throat> so that all probably is fairly straightforward. The real magic is how do you set these weights in such a way that it really achieves something useful, right? And that's the learning aspect of this. And this is where it does get really complicated. Um, so that comes from, once again, we don't restructure the network. We don't change the way the neurons and, and the synapses are plugged together. We really just change how much any one synapse contributes to the next neuron in the graph, right, or in the network. And we do this supervised learning process where we're going to say, we know what this input is. This input's circle. So when I feed that into the network, it's going to say, that was a triangle. And we say back to the network, that was wrong. You were quite wrong, actually. We need a measurement of how long that is. Adjust your weights and try again. And we do this over and over and over with a variety of different inputs that kind of represent the whole data set that we're interested in classifying. Uh, and then eventually, the network will get it right with things it's never seen before. So I said that we have to kind of know how wrong it was, right? Uh, it's not enough to just know that it was wrong. We also need to know how wrong it was. And there's a lot of different ways to do this, and unfortunately I'm going to run out of time if I spend a lot of time here. But we use something like the mean square error. You might have seen this in statistics or other mathematics that you've done. Um, and this just has some really nice properties that it provides an error function that has kind of like a roughly like a parabola shape. Uh, so it's got this real smoothness to it. It has some properties that make it easier for us to decide how much we need to move any one particular weight based off of uh, the current error and which direction that it needs to move. So I kind of already alluded to we're not going to do what is probably the obvious thing. If you were thinking about this, how would I adjust the weight? So I know that the answer was wrong. How do I write some code that would put the weights where they're supposed to be? So you could naively think, and this is what I'm sure I would have tried if I were one trying to develop this technique, would be just to try every possible value, right? Like, okay, let's just try every weight. And every combination of weights in that network eventually will lead to, if we try them all, the one that produces the least error, right? But even for a very simple neural network, that becomes a huge problem really quick. You're not going to compute it in 
seconds, it's going to be days and years and centuries if you've got a really, really big neural network with a lot of weights, right? So it's a huge combinatorial problem. So we can't do the brute force method. What people developed and what's commonly used is something called back propagation with gradient descent. And this is a really interesting thing, and this is kind of like I said, where all the magic happens, but it really requires a little bit of understanding of calculus and partial deliver derivatives to really grok kind of what's going on here. So I've got this slide up here that's probably a little more detailed than it needs to be. Um, let, us, let me just kind of give you the overview. The basic idea is that we start at the end. We know that we got the wrong answer, so we start at the last nodes, or neurons in the network, and we sort of figure out how much of the error to attribute to each of those nodes based on the weightings of those nodes. So we say, well, you're responsible for a lot of the error and you're not responsible for very much of it. And then we look at that error function and we take the derivative of it and that tells us kind of like, are we moving closer to zero or are we moving further away? And which, you know, so which direction do we need to move the weights? Do we need to make the weights bigger or smaller? Uh, and that gets really complicated, quick. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of rushing over it enough that I'm sure it's quite confusing to anyone who hasn't had experience with it before. But, you know, this is kind of a made-up error function uh, for one particular weight in the neural network. We have to do it for all the weights, remember. Um, and just kind of showing, like, we start, the gradient descent part is we start moving closer towards the lowest possible error in steps. And the size of those steps is kind of determined on the slope. So how steep, as you can see, because of that nice parabola shape on the right there, um, the slopes get smaller as we get closer to zero. So that's how we can kind of know we don't have to move as much now. And we also, like now, in this example where we see the red dots kind of moving down, the slope's downward, so we know we need to keep increasing the weight to get closer to zero. If we were on the other side of that parabola, we'd know the slope would be going up, it'd be positive, and we need to know that we move the weight smaller to get closer to the error. And the other little feature that I made up in this graph is to show you one of the complications that comes up it's not always just a nice simple parabola, like your error functions can have these dips that are called local minima, and so there's a place where there's a, your little, you can think of a ball rolling down a hill, if you get stuck in that other little dip, that's not really the minimum value, right? So to avoid this, you have to, par partially it can be in the way you choose the activation functions and how you calculate the error of your network, but also there's just some tricks you can do while you're uh, doing this gradient descent to try to avoid those. <clears throat> Once again, it's probably more than I needed to, probably just confusing enough that it would probably be better off not to say anything, but if you're interested in that, there's a lot of great videos and resources online that meticulously go through, even if you don't have a strong background in math or calculus or anything, and I think can explain this in a way that would make sense to just about anybody. So feel free to use those. So now we've kind of talked about a neural network, and, I, and it's, it's really kind of probably hard to visualize. Like I remember reading about this and it's really not understanding how does it really do anything useful. So one of the things that helped me was this demo, and I'm going to pop out to you for a second. I'm not going to explore it a lot, but you could do it on your own. So it's this great website, uh, the TensorFlow Project. This is a bunch of open source uh, machine learning stuff that I think Google provides this stuff. Um, and this is just a cool demo of a network you can run in your browser. And you can actually add hidden layers and you can control how many nodes are in the hidden layers. The input are just these data sets, right? So um, in this case, this simple circle data set has like one, all the blue things are in the inner circle and all the orange things are in the outer circle. And we're just trying to train the network to recognize based on where something lies in this data set, should it be blue or orange, right? That's sort of the classification here. So there's just one output that's either blue or orange, right? The inputs over here, what they've listed as features, that's all kind of small up there, I apologize, I wish it was a little easier to read, um, are just like, what, what about the data set are we going to feed into the network? And these first two blocks are just the, the X and Y positions, essentially, of the data, right? Um, but some of these other ones might square that or do other, like take the sign of it or something. So you can kind of experiment with how different features of the input can lead to different behaviors in the network. And notice we just have four layers here. Um, that are connected, these lines are really hard, they're faint, I'm sorry, but they're, um, the strength of them, the, the boldness of them sort of is a reflection of the magnitude or the weight, all right, uh, that is that synapse connecting these two neurons together, and the color represents whether it's negative or positive. If I hit the play button over here, we can watch what happens over here pretty quickly, oh, it looks kind of terrible on that projector, sorry, pretty quickly the network has figured out that all of the things 
in the center area are blue and things on the outside are this grayish orange, should be orange, but it looks kind of weird. Uh, and we can stop it and you can start it again and try again. And notice that what is happening in any one of these neurons, there's kind of like an image associated with it, and it's sort of showing you what that image is class or what that neuron is classifying. So like Interestingly enough, this, this neuron is sort of saying things in the lower left-ish kind of on a diagonal are orange and things in the upper right are blue, right? And this one's saying things towards the top are orange and things towards the bottom are blue. And this one's saying things are blue. So actually it's not very useful. You can see there isn't a whole lot of contribution to it, right, from, uh, from some of the inputs, right? And then this one's saying, oh, things down in this corner are oranges and things up here are blue. And so by just weighting those neurons' contributions differently, we get something that gives us the right answer. And notice if I reset it and do it again, they're gonna end up in a totally different place, right? Like, look, these are all different, but it's still solving the same problem. So there's many ways to set the knobs of this network that will solve the same problem. And what we do is we start from a random set of weights, and that's why it's different every time. So we start at some random place, and then we just keep teaching the system until it eventually learns. So there's a lot of dependency on how random your start is. Notice this is using this, the hyperbolic tangent um, activation function, which is not the sigmoid I talked about. If I switch it to sigmoid and we run it, you're going to see that it takes longer to eventually get the accuracy the same. So there is like, you know, clearly some reasons for this data set with these inputs that using a different activation function gives you a uh, trained network quicker. So once again, have time or, and I'm not even aware of all the details of why that's the case, but. <clears throat> Okay, so I encourage you to play with that because it'll help you kind of get an intuitive sense of what a neural network is doing and you can play with it and change it and see how those changes affect it. So that's the introduction to neural networks. So now let's talk about the prototype that I built uh, for iOS, for iPad with a pencil, uh, for actually detecting some drawn shapes. So our problem here is we want to make an iPad app. We want to be able to detect, I just started with something simple, circles, squares, and triangles. And what I need to do is somehow capture that drawing as data that I can feed into this feedforward neural network. And then I'm going to treat the output. I'm going to have one output node for each classification, circle, square, or triangle. And I'm going to treat each one, uh, treat the outputs that are strong in any one of those as saying that the network classified it as that type of shape. And then to train it, I'm going to have to do that supervised learning, right? So I'm going to have to feed it a bunch of shapes and tell it that was a square, that was a triangle, that was a circle. <clears throat> And here's just a diagram of conceptually what that looks like. So the input, let's just say it's a bitmap in this case. So we make a bitmap of what the user draw, uh, had drawn. We take those pixels and we can just say, how about one node per pixel, right? You could also do every square of four or something, right? There's other ways you could do this. But uh, for the simple, straightforward approach, I just said, all right, each pixel is an input into the network. And then those are all connected to the hidden layer. So there's some number of nodes in the hidden layer. Uh, and those have all those weights on them. And then everything in the hidden layer is connected to the outputs, so one for each type of thing, right? So this is what we're trying to, the structure of the network we're trying to build for this problem. I just want to mention, by the way, that there are many different things besides just the pixels that you could maybe choose to feed into the network to achieve this uh, type of classification. So for instance, if we're thinking about someone drawing a shape, maybe the number of strokes they made is important in determining what type of shape it is or even the direction of those strokes. We might draw certain shapes or digits or letters with strokes that go in a certain direction, and that can be useful. How fast a stroke was in any part maybe is useful. I don't know that it is. The number of angles and the resulting shape, if it's something that's kind of like a polygon of some sort, if it's convex or not, right? So all these things are features you could try to capture and quantify and feed into the neural network. But I thought, well, let's just stay simple. Let's just go with an image bitmap. And it turns out that the image bitmap for this particular problem has plenty of detail. We don't need to go to this extra level of extracting features. And this is pretty straightforward. Like I said, there's just one node for each type of shape that we're outputting. Um, the nodes are going to range from 0 to 1 as the possible values they can take on. So exam for example, as we get this array that comes out of the network that has these floating point values, there's a really high value, 0.945, that's in the second position. And we said second position means square. So we would know that if we saw this output, that the uh, network had detected a square. And then maybe I should mention here too, if you're thinking about how do I construct the answers, so when I'm training the network, if I had a square 
and I was feeding it into the network, I would provide it as an answer. I would give it an array that had really small values for the circle and triangle positions in that array, but a really high value in the um, uh, position for square. And just as an aside, going all the way to zero or one can cause problems sometimes, um, just because it sort of like cuts off some of the learning in the network. So you might not want to push, force everything to all the way to the maximums and minimums when you're doing that. The structure is just the one we've looked at several times. Uh, it's that three layer fully connected network. One input for each pixel, three outputs. <clears throat> Oops, I hit the wrong button. So now there's still just some parameters to determine, right, to realize this network. For instance, how many input nodes should there be, right? Well, I chose 784 because I made 28 by 28 pixel bitmaps of the shapes. Why did I choose that? Out there in the literature, there is this data set of hand-drawn digits. It's this big data set of many, many different people drawing digits. And they're all 28 by 28 pixels. And there's a million examples of neural networks that use that data and work. So I thought, yeah, maybe 28 by 28 is a good place to start. And it turns out that works. So I didn't really explore trying different sizes. Uh, but obviously, that sort of the resolution is going to perhaps give you more detail that you're capturing, right? Uh, there's 280 hidden nodes, and for a very similar reason, I started there uh, because there was some examples that did something similar to what I was wanting to do that used 280 hidden nodes. And everything that I read sort of from the, uh, maybe not the academic level, but the sort of like practical application of neural networks, everyone says, this is all just trial and error. You just gotta try stuff, right? And I'm sure if you were to go out and look into the research, there's probably reasons to choose certain amounts of hidden nodes based on the inputs or the types of problems and whatnot. Uh, but it seems like people's general approach when they're first getting started with this is to just kind of do a lot of trial and error. So that also suggests, by the way, that you probably want to have a training set that you can repeat and use over and over again for your neural network so that you can make adjustments to these parameters and the, maybe even the structure of the neural network and see if you got better results. Was it more efficient? or did it get better accuracy, right? Um, so that's an important part of this, repeatability and testing. So let's just switch now to the demo of the app that I built, which is a little ugly, I apologize. I thought I would make it better, but I ran out of time. Uh, here is where we are. So my ambition was to have this canvas view where you'd be able to draw stuff eventually, but all I really got done was the learning and detecting part. So it's a little awkward the way the UI fits together here, but um, down at the bottom we can draw shapes. So I'll draw something, maybe, uh-oh, is my pencil broken? I'm gonna have to draw with my finger. I don't know what happened with my pencil. Um, hmm. So I drew something kind of square-like, and you can see that blue box sort of shows what we fed into the bitmap, we fed into the neural network, and the green box shows what it detected. So that detected a square, even though it's got round corners. Sorry, that was just the Unicode character I could find. Um, if I draw something circular, it's gonna say, oh, that was a circle. And if I draw something like a triangle, it's going to get a triangle out of that, right? And there's some switches at the top, so if I turn on square, then I want to draw a square down here because now I'm telling the network, hey, that thing I just drew was a square, and use that to do learning. So this is how I trained it. I started with something that was wrong, always, so it started with completely random values that was never classified right. And I just kept, I'd draw a few squares, I'd switch it to circle, I'd draw a few circles, I'd switch it to triangle, I'd draw a few triangles, and kept doing that over and over, and somewhere around, I don't know, between 50 and 100, just depending on how things went, uh, the network would usually train up and be able to recognize my handwriting and the handful of people I've tried it on. So it didn't take a whole lot, for some reasons that I'll get to, I think, because I simplified the data set quite a bit. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you that's really kind of cool is that um, uh, you can, I, all the training I did was things like this, where I stroked pretty clearly something that looked like a square, right? I mean, obviously that's a terrible square, but it worked. Uh, if you were to, though, this is gonna be hard to do without the pencil, but uh, kind of create something that was dotted, it still could possibly recognize that as a square or a circle. Boy, this is a lot easier to do with a pencil. Right, and I didn't provide any sample data that was dashed like that, right? Uh, so it's pretty cool that it's able to pick up the features from that, which is way different than what I provided to it, and still get the correct answer. So I thought that was a pretty cool um, feature of this and how it all worked out. The other thing I wanted to show you real quick, so I'll talk about it in a slide later, is even if I draw a small little thing up here, it still gets it. And notice that the thing we provided to the network, 
the image we provided the network looks a lot like even if I drew a big square right in the center. Right, so I did a lot of work to sort of normalize the input so that regardless of the size and where you drew it, or even if I drew a rectangle, it still looks like a square that we fed into the network, right? So that just sort of like reduced the size of the possible data set so that it was easier to train everything. All right, switch back to the slides. So how, did, how do we build this, right? So we talked about this model neural network. So, you know, hey, we need some neurons and synapses. And that's actually really easy. That's just sort of like something that sums and multiplies and something that sort of says this thing is connected to that thing and, and has this weighting, this floating point value. Easy to do, a couple hours, right? Uh, we need an activation function. Also just some pretty easy math. There's, you know, plenty of examples of how to implement that. And there, that particular function exists in a lot of math libraries. We said we needed to understand the error and the cost, so we could use uh, least squared error, not too hard to calculate, pretty straightforward. But then that whole part that I kind of hand waved over, that whole gradient descent and adjusting the weights and you know having to deal with local and minimum, uh, uh, maxima and minima and non-convex functions and all this other stuff gets tricky. And I didn't want to get lost in the weeds trying to implement all that stuff while my problem was more about uh, a little higher level, just wanting to be able to build something that could detect shapes. So I just went and relied on a library. And there's tons of libraries out there that will do these things, right? Um, I picked one in Swift because I know Swift and it made sense to me. Uh, and also this particular one was really low bells and whistles, straightforward easy to use, so I felt like if I wanted to make modifications to how it kind of implemented that core feature of a, a neural network, I would be free to do that pretty easily. Like say if I wanted a different activation function, it looked like it would be really easy to add it to this network, or to this library. By the way, if you go look, I've included a copy of this in the source code that I published for you guys. The author of this has since refactored this library, and I haven't updated to it, and it's way better now. Like, in, in the sense that it's just more clear. It's kind of like the second pass, and everything about it's more clear and a little easier to use and a little more straightforward. So uh, it'll look different if you go get that source code from what I'm providing you guys, uh, but just know that it functions essentially the same. <clears throat> you might be saying, why didn't you use Core ML, right? Because even some of this Core ML stuff, that, uh, the, particularly the neural network part of it, existed even in iOS 10 today and as well as the stuff that's coming with iOS 11, right? And the main reason for that is that's all set up to just sort of do the querying or the running of the network on the device. It isn't going to help you do the training and the creation of the neural network, right? The uh, trained neural network. And I, you could, you know, you could split that into two parts, and that's probably what a lot of people do for these bigger problems is say, all the training and the creation of those weights happen elsewhere, and all I really need to do on the device is run it. But I wanted to be able to explore being able to have the user influence the training of the network after it had already been in one state. And that would have been really complicated to do if it was all off, you know, if there was this offline component that had to contribute to it. So I didn't explore using Core ML for it. Um, but if your problem is such that you don't really need that, you can very easily use TensorFlow and all these other tools to make your networks. And the new stuff coming in Core ML will let you import the structure of those networks and efficiently run the querying or classification part of the network on iOS devices. Now, if you're interested in building that part, like you wanted to implement the Swift AI part yourself, there's this really cool book that I found last year uh, that um, is called Make Your Own Neural Network, and it just takes you through building it from scratch in Python, something that can detect those handwritten digits that I talked about, that big data set that's out there for publicly available to use. And this thing's really good because he, he writes it in a very clear way, and even though there is a lot of math and calculus that is required to get to the end result, one, when you actually look at the code, it's quite simple. There's not much to it. And two, he explains it in a way that even if you don't have a big background in that math, I think you would be able to latch onto it and get some value out of it. So if you're interested in this and you want to really know how the guts of the neural network work, I would explore this book. All right, we've got a little bit of time, so let me just talk about that uh, interface, because you guys can go explore this code on your own later, but the interface to that Swift library. And once again, the names of these functions have changed a little bit in his refactoring, uh, but it largely works the same. So it has, uh, the main class is FFNN, feed forward neural network. Uh, and it takes all those parameters like I specified on one of those slides earlier. How many input nodes are there? How many hidden layer nodes are there? And how many outputs? And once again, this one reason I chose this library, it's just set up for that simple one input, one hidden layer, 
one output, right? Um, and so that made it a lot easier to look at and reason about. It has this idea of a learning rate, has a default value. You can start with default values. This is another one of those places where people will say, you just have to experiment to know what the right number is to, to choose. And the learning rate is about, if you imagine every time we had uh, a right, we're trying to train the network and we know the right answer. If we train the network to give the perfect right answer, we've kind of probably blown it for some other types of inputs, right? Like we've adjusted the weight so it won't answer the other ones very well. So it's kind of called overtraining your network. So the learning rate is sort of a way to moderate how close to the right answer we try to adjust the network when we're in that learning process so that it's a little more fuzzy in the way that it operates, right? And momentum is also kind of related to how we're moving those weights around. Default values work for me in my example here in the prototype. Uh, also, this one lets you choose from a couple of different activation functions. Default was the sigmoid for this class at the point that I used this. And error function is just an averaging error function, kind of like what we saw. Two main methods that sort of uh, you would use to use this class after you've constructed it. It has an update method. This probably should be called something like query or, or uh, uh, predict or something. And I think it has been renamed in the new version of this library. Update basically takes the input, so we're providing our input to it, and it returns uh, the outputs as an array of floats, right? Um, so that if, our, if we have three output nodes, that, that array of floats is going to be three in size. The network holds on to the last thing it predicted, the weights and, all, and, and the answer to that. And so if you want to learn, you then call this back propagate method with the answer. So you can say, okay, I just asked you to classify this thing with update. But here's what you said this, you, know, you said whatever you said, but it should have been this. And this causes the network to go through one small iteration of learning. So to really train it on a data set, you'd need to be calling this method uh, several times for one input until you got the error pretty close to where you wanted it. But once again, not perfect, right? We want to give a little wiggle room. And then you would do that over and over and over again for a lot of different inputs. And then you might run that whole thing, the whole set of inputs a couple of times to get it kind of fully trained. So you'd be calling this method in some sort of loop to do the training process over and over and over. There's also a couple of methods that read and write from a file, the structure of the network. So once you get it trained, it's really easy to save it and recall it. And uh, there's some example of that in the source code that I provided for you guys. Then the last piece that's really interesting is uh, how do we capture the user's input? So there's some tricks that go on here. Um, so I decided to use a pan gesture recognizer. Hope you guys are familiar with that. And just all the touch points that come to that, I use that as uh, control points and uh, uh, endpoints in a UI Bezier path, right? So I'm making a Bezier path of whatever the user is sketching out, or multiple Bezier paths, because you can lift your pen up and, and draw multiple times. We stroke that path. And we just keep updating the path as new touches come in until after we've not seen touches for about a second, we go, they must be done drawing, let's move on and treat that as the shape that we're supposed to interpret. Now, if you're familiar with doing any kind of drawing programs or anything, you might think, why are you using Bezier path instead of just like stamping out a little brush tip and making uh, the image that way? And the reason was, remember I talked about kind of normalizing the data so that it would make it easier to train the network? Um, the path gives me a way, one, to smooth the edges and, and get a nice natural looking result. I'm not positive that really matters for the detection efficiency, uh, but I did it anyway because I like looking at it. Uh, then the other reason is because that let me easily normalize the stroke width. So no matter how big you draw your shape, the final thing I feed to the network always has the same stroke width. And so that kind of reduced the overall set of things I'm trying to classify and made it much easier to train the network. I'll just go past this really quick, but if you're interested in how to make a really cool smooth path from touch points using Bezier path, there's a little trick to it uh, that's described in this WWDC session. It's also in the code I'm providing you to get something that looks really natural and doesn't have a lot of jaggies or weirdness. Uh, then we also have to prepare that bitmap for processing, right? So we've got this path. We're going to render it into a bitmap, and that's what we're going to hand off to the network. Um, I go out of my way to make sure that I crop this to just the drawing, to just the path itself, right? So once again, if you draw something small, we're not going to have a bunch of white space. Because you can imagine, it would be much harder to train the network if squares could be little tiny things in, in any corner of the space that's available to draw, or in the middle, or big, or all these different sizes. So I go out of my way just to try to capture the minimum bounds that the path represents, draw that into this regular 28 by 28 bitmap, 
And that's where that scaling happens so that if you draw a rectangle, it ends up actually being the square. Uh, and then once again, we scale it down because we don't, 28 by 28 was more than enough, maybe for this problem even less uh, pixels. If we kind of captured it at the screen resolution, we'd have a lot more pixels and uh, perhaps doing a bunch of unnecessary calculation that could make it slow. It wouldn't be so slow in the detection, but it would make the training slower because that's where we're doing most of our work. Uh, and then once again, like I said, we stroke the path to make sure it's always the same. And then the other thing we need to do, usually when you get drawn to a bitmap on iOS, that's going to be an RGB context, right? So color is not important for this problem. Like we're not trying to detect the difference between apples and bananas or something, right? So it doesn't matter what color the thing is. Uh, we just want to know the structure of the shape. So we could keep it RGB, but then we'd need three times as many uh, inputs than we did if we just converted to grayscale. And I did want to note that you could also consider, really, you only need one bit, maybe, right? You don't necessarily need grayscale to solve this problem. But one thing is, it's actually kind of harder to deal with one bit data sizes, right, in, in most of our programming languages. So it's a little easier to work with grayscale for that reason. Also, there's a little bit of like anti-aliasing that happens when you stroke the paths that have curves to them. And I know this, it seemed to me, I didn't really totally empirically prove, uh, prove this, but it did seem to me that that influenced the learning a bit, right? So those grayscale values were something that did impact how the network performed. So I stuck with that. And then once again, I got to scale those and make sure they're clamped between zero and one, right? Because that's what our network expects. So how did I go about training this thing? Well, uh, I had to draw a lot of shapes, right? So I went and looked and there aren't a lot of freely available examples of people drawing very simple polygons out there that I could throw at this thing. So I had to draw all the shapes myself in the application after I built it. And you'll see if you look at the code, I just started a thing where every time I drew one for training, I would save that one off. And uh, then it was really easy to um, uh, build up my own little data set so I could then in bulk reapply those all the time. Last thing. So I didn't talk about rejection. So the way that this thing works is that uh, it's always going to detect something. But you know, some things, like a squiggle, is not necessarily a shape, and we should reject those. So we probably had to put some sort of thresholding over like how confident do we have to be it was a square before we're going to say it's a square. It doesn't deal with skews and rotations. You could just train the network to all those things. But you might also be able to just sort of perform transforms on your input data during your training so that you didn't have to deal with uh, them all being rotated. If you play with it, you'll notice that like I trained it for triangles that are always pointing upward, right? So if you draw a downward face of triangle, it's probably not going to detect it. But if we went and tried to handle rotations by training it on rotations, then uh, it would work with that. Maybe it'd be cool to capture additional features, like if we start to expand this to do more than just these three simple shapes, like I talked about angles or convexity or something might be interesting. And I didn't really explore in this sample yet providing uh, ability for the user to influence an already trained network to see how hard that is and how realistic of an uh, answer that is for that particular problem. And performance didn't really care about performance. It's fairly performant, but didn't go over any of those sort of details. Finally, if you get the slides, I, uh, there, there's a Slack channel for presentation materials. I put the link to the slides in there. Uh, and so here's some, some of the resources that I had used when I was exploring this and learning about it. That's it. Mostly fit. Great. Hope you all enjoyed it. Talk to you soon.